Ancient Athens is still in a dark age, but things are about to change and change rapidly. The farmers are growing themselves, but so is the oligarchy of aristocratic men and landowners. Both want more control of the city, tensions are high, and things are soon to kick off. Now going by the way the number of wells and graves increased from the 10th to the 8th century BC, we can infer a slow and steady rise in the population of Attica in the wake of the Bronze Age collapse, which I covered quite briefly in our last regular episode. You see, the way the graves of this period are laid out and created show a distinct social structure like the one we find later in the Archaic period, so roughly 750 BC to 500 BC. It basically shows a kind of oligarchy. A grave found in the Athenian Agora, so the central marketplace, and which was not yet an Agora, and you know, we'll see that much later. This area had the cremated remains of a woman buried with a set of gold earrings. This stands out to the numerous other graves in the region, with gold being as much an expensive privilege as it is now. The grave also came with an unusual box of clay with the small representations of five granaries on the lid. Huge vases with geometric ornaments and fresas of human figures and animals identify high-born graves. Now this class would later come to be known as the, and here's a bloody difficult word, Pentacosiomedimonoi. Oh God. And why are they called this? It's in reference to the amount of productive land that they would have, roughly 5,000 medimonai. That's around 730 bushels. This was the minimum required to be acknowledged as a member of the class. Graves of the lower warrior class, or those who could afford to buy and maintain a horse, come with a sword wrapped around the burial urn. One such grave in Attica came with the iron bridle bits for a horse. And this later class came to be known as the hippias, or knights. Hippiae, mother the graves can also be identified by the inclusion of a cosmetic box known as the Bixithis, which have small clay horses and handles for their lids. We see a similar pattern in other parts of Greece. The sites of Lefkandi on the island of Iboa, off the eastern coast of the mainland, have similar graves with a similar order of rank. A building uncovered in the Peloponnese has the typical modesty of Dark Age architecture, but with a twist. It comes with a megaron, a type of central space common to the Mycenaean palaces. While no palace, it does suggest that this was the home of an important family, or at least a family that thought of itself as important. The chances are pretty high that this aristocracy was not any continuation of the powerful families of the Mycenaean or Late Bronze Age Greeks. That is, despite the claims of myth, with many prestigious families tracing their origins to Theseus, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's all just rubbish, really. It's more likely that the class came about through time and by successful farming, alliance building, and through the expansion and consolidation of arable land holdings. I mean, being a chief in the Dark Age probably helped too, right? So a lot of this aristocracy were chiefs, and the chiefs basically got their power in the Dark Age through all the above. Successful farming, alliance building, protecting, being, I guess, strong in some sense. Indeed, there is no minted currency at this time, certainly not one that we know of, but a surplus in grain would certainly provide one with a more or less equivalent amount of power and influence in an otherwise precarious period, perhaps enough to establish oneself as, well, a chief. And this really starts to take off around 900 BC. We have little information on how this aristocracy ruled, with most of our knowledge coming from the author of the Constitution of Athens, a work penned by an anonymous student of Aristotle's. According to this text, the primitive constitution of Dark Age Athens, likely the late Dark Age, is indeed oligarchic. The poor, together with their wives and children, were the slaves of the rich, and were described as Pelatai and Hectemorai. Pelatai refers to free men working for hire. The Hectemori translates as six partners. The status of this group is disputed, but certainly going by the etymology, the prevailing view is that it refers to the sharecroppers forced to hand over a crippling five six of the harvest to the landowner. So these are sort of like proto-serfs. And really this goes to show that land is really the problem here, or rather land is the benefit if you have it. To quote the constitution of Athens, the whole land was under the control of a few men 
and if the ordinary people did not pay their due, they and their children could be seized. Their children seized? Well, that's certainly going to upset a few people, isn't it? And worse still, all loans were made on the security of the debtor, meaning that many had effectively sold themselves into slavery. Because, you know, you can't pay your debt back. You're the collateral, mate. Off you go. There are few non-perishable goods and food around also. So you can imagine if you're a farmer, a modest farmer, one bad harvest was probably enough to put you under and probably enough to land your farm and your person within the grip of an aristocratic clan, which of course would only further power that aristocracy with success breeding success. And it's not like these farmers had any real right of appeal, let alone the chance to change the system. Because the tradition has it that the city had a chief magistrate or King Archon who held office for life until about 681 BC, when the, uh, the term has changed to 10 years. But the point is, the King Archon is always from the oligarchy. And the reason that it's changed to just 10 years is probably to resolve a conflict between aristocratic families and their bid to control the city. The King Archon was first, in other words, of all the official positions. Then later comes the Polymarch and just the General Archon. The Polymarch was essentially the top general and was added to the constitution, we are led to believe, in response to a series of military failures of several King Archons. The Archon, the newer Archon, is responsible for non-traditional ceremonies, or rather ceremonies that count as later additions, such as the sitting on the Council of the Areopagus, or Hill of Ares. The council had the duty of watching over the laws and the right to punish offenders without appeal. So we come at last to our conclusion. We have seen that out of the Bronze Age collapse comes a Dark Age. It's so cold because there's so little evidence from this period and relatedly because the way of life was primitive in comparison to what came before it. It was a definitive step back. But we also saw that it did not take long, relatively speaking, for the population to start growing again and out of this for a new elite to emerge, the aristocracy, which of course in Greek means rule of the best or excellent, as in ariti, excellence, and krasia, as in the rule of or by. Now aristocracy turns to oligarchy, which really means rule by the few. The oligarchic essence of Dark Age Athens is hardly surprising given the strong emphasis on competitions or agon and excellence, areti, that we find in the aristocratic Homeric value system, the so-called Homeric standard. To excel over others, to compete against them, is the essence of the warrior, the good warrior, the good man, the noble man, the born to rule, the agathon. But despite all of this, there's a democratic element to be gleamed. Certainly in terms of rhetorical competition between aristocrats and the people, which is really an offshoot of poetic recitals and epic storytelling by bards. The open competition of thought and speech is, as the Athenians will later find, really the essence of democratic debate and the free exchange of ideas. So in a way, competitive excellence could be put to use for cooperative ends. The real challenge comes in cooperating with the peasants. And there were many, many, many more of them to come. And this time, shit really is gonna kick off. When we're talking about the class struggle in ancient Greece, some of you might think of Marxism. Well, we made an episode in which we explore if Marxist theory can be applied to ancient Athens, which you can see right here. You can really help us out by sharing and subscribing and by checking out our Patreon page if you really like our work. Thanks and yasas.